afternoon, everybody. Welcome to London. Welcome to our symposium on the European Union Raw Material Initiative, responding to key legal and policy issue, which is organized jointly by our Institute for Sustainable Resources and the UCL Faculty of Law. Um, I'm happy to see you here. Before I really start with just a few opening remarks, I would like to thank you for coming. I would like to thank uh, Chiara Ameni for writing this excellent background paper, and indeed the two main organizers, uh, which is um, Alison Parker and Amy Walker. So thanks a lot. It's been great. And I should admit that we have had a second symposium this week, so in particular, those two have been extremely busy in the previous days. So, uh, my words of welcome. I think we all join a sort of fascination for the topic of resources, right? And when we look around, it's easy to see that this issue has been climbing up the ladder, has been climbing up the agenda recently. There is the issue uh, of some resource conflicts were most prominently probably the tensions between China and Japan have come up not being, uh, not becoming easier since the election of the new prime minister in Japan. And there is indeed the bigger picture of the Americas turning back, coming back to the energy supply equation. Uh, which is due to the discovery and exploitation of unconventional fuels. And as partly as a result of this, we see that the prices have become more volatile than ever before. And the expectation is that the commodity prices will remain to be volatile. What is interesting these days, say with a look back to the previous part of this year, is that the prices have started to split between the energy prices going up not thanks to the discoveries in the US, but thanks to our friends in the Middle East, mm -hmm. uh, but also that the metal prices have been going down for a while. And this kind of uh, separate price development is also a part of the new realities. Uh, and indeed, what is also then interesting to note is that G8 has put much more emphasis on the issue of transparency in the raw material markets, the latest summit took place here in the UK, in Northern Ireland, it was under the leadership of the UK government, and it was their initiative to put transparency at the forefront. So quite often, nevertheless, we have been asked, what's new? Isn't this the old stuff of the geophysical scarcity? And some of you might even remember the report Limits to Growth that came out in the early 70s. These things are more or less over. I guess most of the geologists in particular have uh, sufficient certainty that most materials are available. So it's not the issue of geophysical scarcity, it's more the issue of access to those resources and the line with this, and on top of this, it is the emergence of new superpowers that have a heavy weight on those markets. It's not only Russia, it's also Brazil, it's China, and. Uh, um, some more. Uh, but in parallel, there is also the issue of fragility. Some of the new major suppliers are more fragile than you might think. It's not only, say, the African mining countries or some of the new mining countries in Southeast uh, Asia. It's also the uh, phenomenon that countries were before, these are extremely stable. Think about Iraq. Uh, think about what Central Asia these days these uh, countries are less stable, in fact, than we might think. So taken together, this adds uncertainty to the market. And then there is a whole notion of equity. There is a huge concern with food security <coughs> these days for very good reasons. And this has intersections also with the markets for minerals, not only when we look at the phosphorus market, but also when we look at the different construction processes, urbanization, and the access to the availability of fancy products, uh, energy prices, you name it. So this all intersects with the environmental challenges. And the environmental challenges go by far beyond the scope of 
uh, doing mining in a more environmental manner and they also go by far beyond the climate change agenda. It is more the intersections between the local turbulences spreading around and global issues, global forces, which quite often overshadow quite successful regimes which have been established in agriculture, in water management, etc. So when we look at the issue, it is probably the uh, integration issue. There is this parallel stream of activities which we will discuss during the course of the afternoon called Raw Materials Initiative and Resource Efficiency Initiative. But when you take a closer look and look at the history of those initiatives, you realize that those have been formulated by different parts of different administrations, DGs, etc. It's probably a bit simplifying, but one can say that the Raw Material Alliance is by and large concerned with the supply risk. It's by and large the external dimension. It looks at the excess, the prices, etc., etc. Mainly with a view of getting it better done for industry. Well, the resource efficiency agenda is the downstream perspective, the internal market perspective, with a uh, great bias on the environmental side, developing indicators, targets, and indeed having an emphasis on process innovation and the like. So the question would be, for those trying to align those agendas, how can we bring the environmental agenda closer to the raw material initiative and how could we also strengthen the international dimension of the resource efficiency agenda because those fancy markets exist out there and as long as those markets are distorted it is quite difficult for producers here in the UK or other parts of Europe to export those more resource efficient products. What is almost neglected I would say is the security perspective. This is something what you come quite across with when you read the news, when you go around outside Europe, in particular the US, and it's serious. It's not only the case which we just discussed with China and Japan, it's also here at the doorstep, the southern part of the southeast Mediterranean Sea. It's also this tiny little island up and down there, which some of you may still know, called Falkland Islands where the Brits have uh, made their uh, effort to keep it as part of the United Kingdom. And you might have also realized that two years ago, the Argentinian government, they expropriated an oil company from Spain. So they take the issue seriously in considering the access to resources located there. We are far from certain that this will be settled out by diplomatic means. And the same goes for the river issues in Northern Africa and in Asia. So indeed, the security agenda is there, and it somehow should become probably more visible on the European policy agenda. Nevertheless, it's easy to criticize, it's easy to suggest great new ideas. What is interesting to see is that uh, new opportunities arise with emerging policies. There is the recent directive which the EU did uh, prior to the G8 <coughs> summit for accountability and transparency of the expected industries. There is the even more recent announcement of Commissioner Potocznik that the indicators and targets which he is um, announcing to propose next spring will have to cover the external dimension, the hidden flows, uh, and those things, and there is the launch of what is called the European Innovation Partnership on Raw Materials with a Strategic Implementation Plan. And indeed, there is a bigger picture of the Euro crisis where indeed all efforts to integrate policies and put subsidies um, well, on, on, on the agenda uh, will become reinforced. And the paper written by Chiara also refers to some of the basic treaties where the principles are laid down simply that need to be uh, formulated and made to be more precise. So this may have to trigger the agenda we will be discussing today. Short spotlight, but not too long on transparency. This is one of the big issues out there in most of the expected countries. The EITI, the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, is going to launch stakeholder platforms in those countries. It might be a fascinating idea to transform, to use, to utilize those platforms also as national platforms to formulate sustainable resource management strategies. Right. 
So there are those opportunities emerging along those initiatives. The wider perspective, indeed, is also relevant from a legal perspective. Property rights, usually you think about commodities as private goods. That's fair enough. That's, uh, that's how they have been treated and traded quite successfully <coughs> over decades. <coughs> Nevertheless, there is the environmental dimension. There is the multi-level issue within the European Union. So it become more Europeanized, if I may say so. What about the issue of materials, stewardship, leasing materials? There are good cases also of shared management. The oil industry knows a great deal about benefit sharing agreement. We might also think about a global mapping exercise where the environmentally sensitive areas could be mapped against the availability of resources. This can be done jointly, potentially. And this is far beyond those private or national strategies that are currently pursued. Also, when you look around, what is the sort of consensus concern? It might be the environment, yes. But it might be less so the environment. Uh, what is definitely a concern is price volatility. So what efforts could be done to smooth price volatility? Would all have to be considered as market intervention? <coughs> could we think about market-based institutions that monitor markets, give more transparency? Those are also some of the broader thoughts where indeed some of the old agreement ideas might come up, or global governance ideas. So it's a bigger agenda, I may say. Um, coming to an end, what would be the role for legal and policy responses? It's definitely the often said, but more rarely done, agenda of policy integration and policy coordination. There's more clarity on the risk and threats than it is on the likely policy and legal responses. Uh, industry, indeed, is also in a sort of a uh, sort of ambiguous position. Quite often, my feeling is that in particular, more medium-sized companies, they feel a bit left alone with all the uncertainties on the market. Uh, and indeed, when you look around, there is much bilateral cooperation going on. But it's not in the case that the countries merge and try to formulate more pre-lateral, if more multilateral approaches. So, what's the heck? Interesting. So, the question is whether Europe could turn the advantage, the comparative advantage it has, <coughs> environmental technologies, assessment policies, into new approaches. To what extent the existing partnerships can be enlarged to include more sustainability aspects, regional development, resource nexus ideas, to what extent an international multi-stakeholder platform could be established, um, plus an international data hub where USGS and the UK Geological Survey and all the other great organizations could cooperate on the data issues and indeed some of the market-based issues like facilitating recycling could also be on the agenda. I think there are enough uh, uh, ideas at the table. I look forward to all the interesting discussions, in particular on the multi-level issues and with the deeper insights of legal expertise that I can share with you. And I really thank you very much indeed for coming and I look forward to the discussions. I just briefly introduce the panel members here. So the first presentation obviously comes from my colleague Professor Mark Nesslin. He's Professor of Plan Planetology here at UCL. Uh, the idea would be that we have like 10 minutes presentation each, followed by a discussion. So we have roughly half the time uh, for discussions. Uh, and then we have 10 members from the British Geological Survey, Head of Science, Mineral and Waste. Great to have you here. And I'm also pleased to see Jaco Koroshi from the Chatham House, an expert on many things, including the criticality of material. All right. Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I have to say many of the things that I'm going to say in my very short 10 minutes have already been um, uh, mentioned. Uh, but what I want to try and do is talk about some of the meta-narratives, the actual policy drivers that are driving the EU to actually look at resources and particularly how we can go to a low carbon economy. So I don't think I really need to introduce this. This is CO2 rising from 1953. 
Uh, you can also see now that, of course, you can tell when a UNF triple C COP meeting is coming up because suddenly all these reports suddenly get published, the BBC starts reporting about climate change again, and then it all goes quiet in the end of uh, December. So um, again, we've hit the highest CO2 level ever recorded. We've had actually hit 400 ppm this year. And just to tell you, this is, of course, the future as it looks. So this is the last uh, thousand years. The instrumental record shows uh, the hockey stick showing that strong warming, and then there are the projections based on our decisions, whether we decide to go down a low carbon route, which is blue, or the red uh, high emissions route, which is called business as usual. I call it the George Bush approach to global economics. So, but what does that actually mean in terms of carbon and therefore the low carbon economy? So, starting in 1750, this is how much we've already put. We've put about half a trillion tons of carbon into the atmosphere. And actually, according to uh, leading scientists, basically, if we say that two degrees is the safe climate, okay? Now, that has huge connotations about what you consider safe. If you happen to live in Tuvalu and you're completely flooded, you probably say two degrees is not safe. But again, this is a uh, political decision. But we're half full. And the problem is that that trillion tons is probably what keep us to two degrees or below. We're going to hit sometime in 2044. By the end of the century, if we assume a 1% increase per year, we will hit two trillion tons by the end of the century. Now, the interesting thing is the energy-related CO2, even with the crash over the last 40 years, has increased at 2% per annum, not 1%. Just to give you an idea of the figures we're playing. So, of course, in the ideal world, and of course, us scientists, we love to draw beautiful, simple diagrams, and then we turn around to you and go, well, why can't you put policies in to do this? It's easy. Reduce the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. And so here we have Annex 1 and uh, non-Annex 1 countries, and we're showing you the stabilization curve to keep the world to that 2 degrees. And that is the challenge. But that looks nice and simple, because, of course, we draw nice diagrams like this. But this gives you an idea of the real challenge. So this is current emissions per capita uh, for the United States, Russia, Japan, EU, right in the middle, and what we think is going to happen in 2030. So with the very progressive approach of the EU, you can see there is a small dip. To make it to that two degree safe limit, we need to hit two tons of carbon per person per year. That red line is where we all have to get to if we're going to stay within that safe climate. So that gives you the challenge. And of course, this is great. So what we want to do in Europe, of course, is have a fantastic green economy, uh, install lots of uh, renewable energy, and cut out um, oil and gas coming to the EU. However, to be realistic, the problem is that, of course, actually at the moment, rapid development means that the amount of demand for fossil fuels outstrips the actual supply. Now, of course, that's politically motivated because of price. However, what it means is that this wonderful idea of ours that we're going to actually uh, cut out all that CO2 that we're going to burn, no. Actually, if we go to a green economy, actually all that's going to happen is that fossil fuel will be re-diverted to other parts of the global economy. So please keep that in mind. That doesn't mean we shouldn't go for a green economy, but it's not going to make the global cut you are expecting. So how does this relate to raw materials? So I'm showing you everything from sort of like uh, fuel cell buses, uh, wave power, fusion. It might work one day. Um, but this is the challenge in the UK. So this is the Climate Change Committee's view. I told you, scientists are very good at drawing graphs into the future with little idea of how to actually do it. So the key thing there is this huge drop, a huge drop in the amount of fossil fuels that are emitted by generating electricity in this country to make our legal, legally binding 80% cut by 2050. 
And of course, that's going to have to be done through renewable energy, such as solar, wind, and tidal. So where do warm materials come in? So, one of the most important uh, metals, of course, is copper. Copper is used for everything in electric power, uh, equipment, automobiles, radiators, refrigerating, the whole work. It's one of the most important metals that we use. And as you can see, this is the production that has occurred since the 1900s, and there is a myth, which has already been referred to, is everybody gets upset about peak copper, just like peak oil was suddenly going to run out of it. And you'll start to find these diagrams that always do a sudden dip or a hill into the future. And I just put on uh, onto the right hand side uh, the actual uh, damage that course that copper mining actually creates. However, I can reassure you that actually our ability to find new reserves of all the metals and oil is actually very, very good. Interestingly enough, as the price goes up, we get even better at finding it. So, what's the second EU drive? So that's climate change. Well, it's sustainability and global stewardship. So the first thing is here, this is the WWF Living Planet Report, and this basically suggests how many planet Earths we actually require to fuel our lifestyle. And bizarrely enough, 1980, seem to be when we actually uh, stopped, um, we went over the resources from one planet and we actually need, we are overusing the resources. Interesting, I think it's also when real music stopped as well. <laughs> so, unfortunately, I do have my undergraduates and they just go, 1980s? What's that? <laughs> that that's, that's history, that's ancient history. Um, so also here, looking at Wollstrom's uh, approach, which is then to look at planetary limits, biodiversity and nitrogen, uh, we have completely blown apart uh, in the actual balance, and we are also doing the same with uh, climate change. So just to pick up on this, of course, we are looking, the EU has a very strong mandate on sustainability and that global stewardship very clear in the negotiations. So this is mining, both uh, large-scale mining, but I think sometimes we also forget that many communities actually rely on small-scale community mining and producing uh, cash from resources that way. We also have bonds with land use and deforestation, which are going to be uh, hopefully dealt with in some way through the Red Plus uh, negotiations. But again, there's an interesting how that Red Plus and the EU regulations will actually overlap and whether they'll be compatible. And the last one, so I don't take up too much of time, is resource geopolitics, which uh, the models already uh, spoke about. So I'm going to pick on rare earth elements, which are absolutely essential to the green economy. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a scientist, I have to put the elements and the atomic numbers, so yeah. Okay. All this shows is, of course, iron, aluminium, very common. Unfortunately, the rare earth elements are actually very uncommon, but actually can be mined quite successfully. So they are absolutely essential for our green economy. So for example, neodymium is required for wind turbines and hybrid cars. Um, if you then go to some of the others, they actually are required to make uh, control rods and cooling rods for nuclear reactors. So all the key elements that we need for a European green economy are actually uh, in this part, or uh, in the rare earth elements. And it's very interesting that in the 1990s, Bizarrely enough, the USA had actually been dominant in producing rare earth elements, and then this slipped off, as you can see, and now 90% of all the rare earth elements are produced by China. So that produces a very interesting uh, discussion about how you actually control uh, the resource and price volatility, which Raymond has already mentioned. So to end up, just to hopefully, uh, I've simulated some thoughts, for me, the key EU policy drivers, the actual meta-narrative that is behind all of this with, where, uh, with the looking at uh, raw materials, is of course climate change, but actually more importantly, I think, is sustainability and global stewardship now. I'm a great uh, believer that climate change is important, but it's something that we have to deal with, but it's a future 
problem, whereas sustainability and global problems are now need to be dealt with. And of course, the classic resource geopolitics. Thank you. I've, I've been, I was asked to talk about um, how Europe gains its mineral intelligence, how it gains its material intelligence, if you like. Um, uh, and it's a bit of a, 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 a sorry tale, really, but anyway, well, here we go. Um, so why, why the previous speaker has already kind of outlined the case for materials, and uh, this is just a graph that I put together showing uh, the EU balance of trade, and, and you can see our import dependence, <coughs> that would be the front anyway, you can see our in import dependence for many key metals, I've got moly here, titanium, aluminium, iron, uh, fluor spar, cobalt is pretty high. Uh, and in fact, uh, the EU balance of mineral trade is very much in the negative. We, we, we import almost a large proportion of almost everything we need. So it's really important, as, again, as the previous speaker said, that, that we are uh, aware of that and that we, uh, we have to accept that. As, uh, we, we are a, co a competitor for global resources. Having said that, um, Europe has 3,000 plus years of mining history. Uh, we have a well-known surface geology. We, we know that pretty well, actually, uh, collectively. Um, we don't know the subsurface nearly as well. Uh, we probably know more about the surface of Mars than we do what, what's 400 metres beneath our feet here. Um, but it's important to say that Europe still has abundant primary mineral resources left, despite 3,000 years of mining. And that, of course, we have, and again, it's already been alluded to, we have abundant secondary resources actually residing in the anthropogenic environment, if you like, that we could reuse or recycle. But again, uh, pause the penalty of speaking a second, um, releasing that wealth from those materials depends on access <coughs> to the materials, very, very much so. Uh, and that access is controlled, as has already been said, by policy and regulation. And that's really a function of all sorts of things. And I'll just put a few down here. Uh, the population density of Europe is, is, is very high, relatively speaking. Uh, it's hard to do anything without coming up against people. Our mining sector and extractive sector has a pretty woeful legacy. Uh, and that lingers in the collective memory of the people. Um, and that brings about uh, what my social scientist colleagues call place protective action what other people might call nimbyism. Uh, and I think the other thing, if you can turn that around, and again, uh, previous speaker alluded to this, uh, is that we've sort of collectively decoupled ourselves, in our consciousness from our conspicuous consumption of resources, from, from the consequences of that. But it's true to say that Europe will remain a net importer of minerals and metals for the foreseeable future. There's no such thing as fortress Europe. We'll never have that. Uh, it's not going to happen. And so we need to understand material flows. We need to understand where things come from, where they occur, where they come from, how they get to us, and what they do once they get into our economy, and what their ultimate fate in the environment might be. And, and we need to do that in order to manage those resources efficiently. So that's what the rest of the talk's about, really. Um, I spent a lot of time over in Brussels, and, and, and People in Brussels always say to me, why can't we do it like the American? Why, why can't we like, be like the U USGS? Why can't Europe have a USGS? And our, our American colleagues, it's true to say, uh, do very well on this, and they are the sort of gold standard for minerals, minerals and materials information. And this is their website, and they produce a yearbook every year, and they do analysis of commodities, they do area reports related to the land area of the US, but they also do international area reports. You can download beautiful statistics from them. Um, sometimes not quite so beautiful, but anyway, it beauty's in the eye of the beholder. And uh, they also produce some spatial information. Here's their analysis of European mineral operations. Um, so the, the Commission's been thinking about this stuff for a while, and uh, they funded one or two initiatives which were, which were sort of in a bleak and in a bleak way intended to address this and that's things like ProMine, which looks at the main mineral deposits of Europe, not all mineral deposits, but the main ones, shall we say, the ones that have been very active mining areas for a long time. 
And there's also a European geosource, which, which is intended to bring together all sorts of spatial geological information, including information particularly on resources. Um, but the important phrase there is spatially related. This is just where things are. Uh, it's not how much or what quantity or how easy are part to mine or what The other main thing about these, these initiatives, good as they are, is they're not complete. You, you cannot get information for the whole of Europe from these issues. And they are, of course, um, and I'll come back to this issue, and this is partly because of the way the EU funds this type of thing. They're just snapshots in time. They're just time slices. So that unlike our American colleagues, these are not redone every year or, or on, a, on, a, on a regular basis. And of course, things change in our business. Um, it's also really important to say that it's not just the Commission that are doing these sorts of things. Um, the member states are doing them as well. And I've got to bang the drum for BGS. Um, we, every year, produce this document called the Mineral, European Mineral Statistics. We've been doing this for uh, about 12 years now. Uh, and that's a pretty comprehensive uh, digest of primary production and trade in 35 European countries. And we publish that annually, and it's behind it sits a big database of, of information. Uh, and that's essentially funded by the UK government. Um, I have to say something about my German colleagues at the BGR, the German Geological Survey, and their sister institution, the Raw Materials Institute. Uh, and they produce an excellent series of uh, regional resource studies and uh, studies on particular commodities. Um, they're really, really good. They, they, in terms of analysis, I think are the best in the world. Uh, part of the problem with them is, is they tend to produce published mostly in German, so they're not widely read, and it does create problems. Um, certainly, I think in, in terms of quality, they're better than, than our American quality. We, we also do some of these things, but uh, not to the extent that the Germans do. My French colleagues and my Scandinavian colleagues also do similar things. But these are very much done uh, with a national member state agenda rather than a European agenda. So currently we're here today to talk about the Raw Materials Initiative, and as part of that, um, the, the Commission has been uh, has, has really thought carefully about this and they instigated a couple of feasibility or three feasibility stu studies. One called Mimbentry, I'm pleased to see Nick Morley's in the room today because it's managed by Opie Hollins. Uh, one called Minerals for EU and one called the Pan European Geological Data Infrastructure. Uh, great name, a eh? sexy title. Uh, EGD, it's tend to be known. I'm not going to speak much about that because that's much more about why the geological data, although it does include spatially related minerals information. But I'm going to talk a little bit very quickly about the first two. So inventory is funded by BG Enterprise. It's a quick, quick project. It's running just over about two years. And it's to look at putting together a pan-European statistical database on resources and reserves. Um, and that with the idea of creating a, a comprehensive directory of key resource information on the EU. And to build a portal for this information um, and to come up with a series of recommendations. So, this is really about looking at metadata. It's about looking at what data are available on resources and reserves, that's all. Now, those resources and reserves include primary and secondary material. So, it's only no data collection is planned as well. So, it's, it's essentially a feasibility study. Uh, that's not trivial, I can, I can assure you. Um, my organization is part of the consortium that things put together. Um, that's the sort of things they're doing. I'm not going into this in too, too much detail, but essentially it's looking at where the gaps in the data are, it's looking at how good the data are, how interoperable the data are, and these are major issues over 35, members, uh, 35 states in Europe. And to develop a roadmap, to a roadmap that might feed into something called the European Minerals Yearbook, and I'll come, that, come back to that now in terms of minerals for EU. This is an FP7 project managed by the Finnish Geological Survey, GTK, and we're one of the main contractors on that leading the work package. Um, this aims to develop a European minerals information network uh, with those, we've already talked about why we need to do that. 
Um, and its main output will be a, a, a European Minerals Yearbook. I've put yearbook in inverted commas because the yearbook really will be an information portal, perhaps looking something similar to what our American colleagues do. It requires a sustainable network of institutions to provide that data, to get that data provided and with the competences to understand that data. It needs to be inspired compliant. Uh, interestingly, again, I put in inverted commas, it intends to create a permanent body before the end of the project. That's quite an interesting one. I'll come back to that. Uh, that's just a list of who's doing what, but it's managed by the GTK, as I say, uh, and uh, Eurogia Euro surveys, who are the, the umbrella organization for European Geological Surveys, based in Brussels, are charged with putting together this network. We're doing, unsurprisingly, because of our work that we're doing already, we're doing the minimal statistics. And unsurprisingly, our German colleagues are doing what we call foresight study, which is some analysis, forward-looking stuff on trends in commodities, etc. So, to finish, um, what are the issues as, as far as I can see them? And these, I have to stress, these are my opinions, my personal opinions, having been involved with this issue for the last seven or eight years. There's a huge issue around data availability. Our policy colleagues and our colleagues in uh, member state governments make huge assumptions about the quality of the data that's available. The, there, the data is very, very patchy, in some cases non-existent, uh, particularly for secondary materials, it's a particular issue. Um, there's a big issue about how we collect data, particularly for resources and reserves. There's a big difference between what goes on in the former Eastern Bloc countries and what goes on in Western Europe. In, in the Eastern Bloc countries, they do this quite well. But in Western countries, we have no tradition of doing this centrally. So we have no information. It's very difficult to get it. And there's a big issue, as you might expect, and I've already mentioned, about data harmonization. It's a big issue. The other issue, as far as I can see, is this long-term management. There's no point in doing this once. We have to keep doing this. We really have to do this annually. Uh, if, we're to, if we're to build a body of information that's going to be of any value to people who make policy, who make regulation. Um, I, as far as I can tell, the Commission haven't really thought about this at all. Um, and so what will constitute this permanent body? That's a really interesting question. And I think the other thing that and again, I stress this is very much my personal view uh, of my experience of this. In, in working in a national geological survey in a big European economy, and I know talking to my colleagues in Germany and in France and in Scandinavia, this, particularly with regard to resource security, tends to trump everything. I don't think any of the big economies in Europe will accept a collective European view about some of these things because of national security issues. It's been very, very difficult um, providing advice to national governments about very strategic raw materials. Uh, I don't think my government would take advice, pardon me, from a Frenchman on that issue. They would want advice from a Brit. <laughs> uh, and on that note, I'll leave it. <laughs> Good. My name is uh, Jakub Kroshi, as already mentioned. I work for Chatham House, the Royal Institute of International Affairs, in a team It's called Energy, Environment and Resources. And uh, we look at these types of issues quite broadly. A lot of my colleagues work on more on issues like climate change and uh, or food security. Um, I'm working a lot on metals and minerals, but one of the great things um, working at Chatham House is that you get more discussion with your colleagues uh, uh, across the landscape. Now, I didn't have a good idea for a title, so I just called it this, uh, European Policy and Wrong Heroes in the Shifting Global Resource Landscape. I'm just going to run through a few slides, uh, making some very general remarks about what is happening around metals and raw materials in the world, and then maybe end up with, with, with a few thoughts on, on what that means for European and EU raw materials policy. Um, now, obviously there are these different motivations for uh, European uh, uh, raw materials policy. Uh, the, the ecological sustainability uh, angle has already been mentioned. 
But I think if we look at the particular uh, genesis of, of, of the EU Rom Raw Materials Initiative uh, that is or has moved uh, to the heart of, 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 of policy making around raw materials at the European level, uh, I think supply security concerns were some of the key drivers. Uh, these are uh, just uh, prices for metals, fuels and food uh, taken from the IMF um, uh, looking back to 1980. And we see this uh, strong run-up in prices uh, around, um, yeah, starting really somewhere around 2002. Um, and then this period of very high and volatile prices. Uh, um, and I've, I've just added uh, a few arrows there on where the two main policy documents, the Raw Materials Initiative Number 1 and Raw Materials Initiative <laughs> Number 2, uh, um, were published, and that is uh, uh, perhaps not so surprisingly around the time of these price spikes. Um, now, prices, as I said, have become uh, also much more volatile. This is measuring uh, volatility in the same data, and, and have another seminar about how you measure volatility in these kind of data, but um, uh, I, I, I would suggest to you that uh, as a back of the envelope calculation, this gives you uh, an indication of how somebody that is buying uh, uh, resources would experience that kind of volatility, um, and we see this very, uh, uh, yeah, very strong increase in volatility, and then if you actually go back to this graph, you see that that last period, that year there, actually prices have fluctuated somewhat less, and you see that reflected here in the volatility data. Uh, you could say uh, um, that was it with volatility, uh, and, and, and uh, I think we take a view at, uh, of, well, Chad Mas doesn't take any views, but uh, uh, <laughs> me and my colleagues uh, 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 take perhaps the view that what we're seeing is more kind of a, temporary breather, and that obviously has to do with the fact that we need to produce much more of these uh, uh, materials and that requires strong price signals. We also see uh, in the globalized world much more uh, potential for disruptions of supply chains, political interventions, extreme weather events, and so on and so forth, that are all powerful drivers of, of increased volatility. Now, this is, um, and, and the following slides will come from a, from a similar data source, uh, is something that we have done, put together very painstakingly, uh, something that's called the Channel House Resource Trade Database. Um, it's basically taking international trade statistics that are widely available, uh, but very user unfriendly, and trying to turn them into something that uh, allows you to uh, uh, scan a bilateral trade. Um, uh, now, after a few years of work on this, we have something that we feel uh, it gives you at least a, a good uh, overall indication. Um, so this is total resource imports. As a rule of thumb, you can think of this, uh, about 50% is fossil fuels, about a quarter is minerals and metals, and a quarter is uh, agricultural products. That's in value terms. In, in volume terms, obviously, the heavier stuff has a little bit of a, a, a bigger um, uh, weight. Um, now, so you see here imports of the main consumers. Uh, there's obviously other importing countries, but this really accounts for the bulk of global imports uh, coming from all kinds of countries. Um, and we see here that Europe's imports have been slowly rising, and then there's a dip from the crisis, but uh, uh, roughly stagnant. Um, US and, and, and Japan. Uh, uh, Actually, the levels have gone down slightly, and then we see uh, uh, rapid growth in, 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 in China and India. Unfortunately, there's a lot of work to put these databases together. Unfortunately, these data only run until 2010, and we're in, a, we're in the process of producing more of this. Um, but I can already assure you with my crystal ball that if you would extend this uh, a little more, that the, the role of, of, of China in these statistics would become even more pronounced. Um, so this is another way of looking at the same data, uh, uh, a little bit more complicated. Here we have disaggregated this into regions. Um, and, and this is, again, all resources together. Um, and we have uh, what you see in gray is basically the, the trade, the regional trade flows in, 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 20, uh, in 2000. 
And what you see in color is new in 2010. And you see, for example, those big new flows of, of uh, stuff like iron ore and copper and soybeans from South America to China. You also see the coal and, uh, uh, and the iron ore flowing from from Australia mainly. Um, and so we get this changing global resource dependencies. And um, yeah, we see uh, uh, that creates a number of new fault lines and a number of new trade frictions as well. Um, China is, again, obviously a, a major driver of this, especially for metals and minerals. This is, uh, at the bottom, you see. Um, uh, China's share in global base metal consumption doesn't look too different if you look at iron ore or uh, this, this has been, the data has been put together by uh, colleagues at Macquarie. Um, we are at the brown bar today, so about 25 to 30% of global consumption of for, for these major metals takes place in China today, um, and that is, uh, will rise by uh, uh, around 2020 to about half of, of global consumption. Now that obviously has a lot of policy and political implications and, and means that um, we making making policy around metals and materials <coughs> without taking China into account at the international level is very difficult. Um, now I showed you this, this uh, slide here about how China's imports are growing. Um, if if uh, I think if you look at China, there's a lot of misconceptions, uh, especially in Europe. Um, I think we have to acknowledge that China is in a very um, uh, transient phase. China for most uh, uh, metals, but also for most raw materials, has been in the past either a major exporter or self-sufficient. Um, there's only a very few types of commodities where China has a long-standing import dependence, such as soybeans. Um, now, over the last couple of years, that has changed dramatically. This is uh, China's uh, uh, coal trade in, in, um, in 2000. You see those large exports flows uh, mainly to Japan and Taiwan. Um, for the rest, there's not all that much happening. Um, this is 2010, and you see how those flows are reversing. Huge flows from Indonesia, from Australia, Vietnam, Mongolia, and again, we only get to 2010 here. If you uh, draw that further, uh, you would see how those import streams are growing even further, making China now in just, uh, I think they became net import dependent, uh, was it in 2008? Um, and, and by now already they are the largest importer of coal in, in the world. So we could show a very similar picture for uh, a range of other re resources, but that means that China uh, and, and, and policymakers in Be Beijing need to very much rethink their role from, from somebody that doesn't really need to care all that much about commodities or commodities trade or is at the exporting, uh, uh, at the exporting um, lever there and, and it switches into a picture where they, similar to Europe really, uh, are becoming more and more a major importer of, of these things. Now, uh, very quickly, um, uh, how, how does the picture look on the supply side? This is just looking in absolute terms how much was added each decade to a range of different uh, extractors resources. Um, it's normalized up a hundred so that you can compare. And you can see that our um, uh, uh, decade has been quite exceptional in terms of the quantities that are being added. Um, but that is not true for all resources. So look, uh, for example, in the 1990s, globally, more oil was added to global uh, supply at a price somewhere around $12 a barrel or so. Um, then we managed with uh, 80 to $150 a barrel over, over the 2000s. Um, so uh, higher prices do not always translate very smoothly into supply. And I'm going to go very quickly over this. Um, so this we try to map here how much price has increased uh, versus how much supply grew, and uh, in an ideal world that should be a nice line, uh, and you see that that is not the case. For some stuff, prices didn't go up very much, aluminium for example down there in the corner, but uh, production increased very fast. For other stuff like copper, prices went up very high, and, and nothing much has happened towards supply. 
Um, now, I'm going to skip this one. This is just to show you that the production of major resources is very con concentrated uh, uh, in, uh, for most types of resources. So three or four players, usually for commodity uh, control, anywhere between 60 to 80 percent of world supply. Um, and this is a, a this is a footnote really on 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 looking at um, how uh, alternative sources of supply, um, like for example recycling, could could change the picture. Here we show something. Uh, this is based on data from the International Aluminium Association. Um, here we see uh, how. Uh, Raw material, primary supply and secondary supply for aluminium have developed since the 1950s, and we see this exponential growth in recycling production. Um, uh, um, yeah, really over the whole period. But then we see even faster growth for 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 the for the primary supply. Um, and and actually, if you look at how much comes out of end of life recycling since the 1990s, that share has actually been slightly dropping. So uh, we, we, we're playing catch up. Now, what does all of this mean for European raw materials policy? Very quickly, um, I think uh, security of supply has been the main driver of the debate in Brussels, especially at DG Enterprise. Um, and I think there's a, there's a question of how the different DGs in, in Brussels uh, um, yeah, uh, um, uh, divide the competencies, if you want to say that this way. Um, uh, I think there has been a lot of focus on China. That has uh, there has been a lot of focus on, on rare earths. I'm a, uh, somebody that is uh, doing a lot of work on rare earths, but I think uh, generally we can say that the attention to it has been undue uh, because it has meant that a lot of other uh, very important commodities in the world have been neglected. Um, and I think that we can see that the rare earths issue has become a roadblock in, in, in dialogue with China. Um, and uh, um, I think that nowadays the Commission has positioned itself in a, in a way where uh, yeah, a sensible dialogue over um, raw materials policy and, and international raw materials governance with Beijing from Brussels is, is almost impossible at the moment. Um, there is some, some more constructive exchanges at the member state level. Um, but I also, uh, and I'll leave it at that, would reiterate the point that um, there, is a, there is a real uh, uh, um, uh, coordination issue uh, <coughs> in Brussels, uh, but also between Brussels and the member state level. And, and so um, we, we're only slowly seeing a, a genuine policy that is not only a policy name taking shape in Brussels. Thank you very much.